So for today's session on early voting and get out the vote training for staging location leaders, this is our agenda. It is jam packed today. I'm going to talk about early vote and GOTV in general, introduce staging location and staging location leaders, then we're going to go a little bit deeper into staging locations and how to physically set up that staging location. Talk a little bit about volunteer recruitment. Then uh, we'll have an opportunity to take maybe a quick break at that point if we need it, uh, because the second half of the session gets real meaty. Um, we'll talk about the roles for staging location leaders during early vote and get out the vote and go through some specific processes of how we're going to run our EV and GOTV programs. One of the important processes we're introducing will be reporting. So I'll show you information about that reporting process. Talk a little bit about staging location, leadership team culture, and our mindset as we go through this critical last phase give you a sneak peek of the scripts and the voter universes we'll be using during GOTV, quick notes on North Carolina voting laws, and then we'll wrap up and I'll share some additional resources and next steps. Um, I'm also delivering these sessions as part one and part two. So um, topics one through four, I trained on last week as part one, five through nine, I'm training those as part two this week. So if there's any of this that you feel like maybe you want to sit in and listen twice, I've had people do it for part one, please uh, feel free to join us and I'll share those links uh, as we wrap up. Jumping into EV and GOTV. GOTV stands for get out the vote. And I think of this as both a verb and a time period. So first, let's get out the vote. That's the verb. And then the time period, traditionally GOTV was the last four days of the election, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, election day. The term has broadened in recent years because people have so many more options for voting. A lot of states, including North Carolina, has really built a strong early vote culture. So I pretty much think of GOTV as a period now, any time when people could be voting. Now, I asked this question as we kicked off and people were introducing themselves. Um, who's been through GOTV before and... What changes, what is different about GOTV versus the rest of the election cycle? If you want to type in the chat, I'm going to be skimming some of this, some of these introductions. Bob, single location more pressure to deliver doors not. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Ooh, switching from ID to GOTV language. Got a first timer. I can see from the introductions, we have more than just one first timer. So um, Bob, Liz, yeah. Those are great examples of things that change during GOTV. What I will say in general is that it gets more intense. It gets more exciting and we do fewer things, but we do way more of it. So those are some kind of the high level ways that I think of GOTV being different. Early vote, which uh, you'll see abbreviated as EV, Early vote is any method of voting before election day, November 5th. So early vote in person. We've got, I think, um, overseas and military people have received their vote by mail ballots. Um, so we are really in the early vote period. North Carolina, we have a great culture here of voting early in person. Um, so some of this information isn't maybe new to us, but 
the early vote period is so important because voters have options. And with those options, it just means reduced barriers to be able to vote. When election day was just one day, if you, I don't know, if you were sick that day, if you got an offender bender, if you couldn't, couldn't something came up at work and you couldn't get away, you might've missed your chance to vote. Uh, but with early vote in this period, we have in North Carolina, October 17th through November 2nd, people have options. So it's uh, more flexible and easier for voters to find a day that's going to work for them to vote. Banking votes during the early vote period helps us kind of narrow the list of people we have to talk to. Uh, you'll see the note here, we'll stop bugging you. Once people have voted, we actually know that information from the Board of Elections. Uh, of course, we don't know who people have voted for, but we can see have they voted yes or no. When people have voted, they will be pulled off of our contact lists. So we are getting more efficient and making sure we're targeting just the people who haven't yet voted that we still need to turn out. And for voters, once you vote, like it's gonna get a lot quieter. We're not gonna be texting you. We're not gonna be calling you. We're not gonna be knocking on your doors. Also, this early vote period is a really good opportunity for us as staff, for you as our volunteer leaders um, to build muscle memory. I'm gonna talk in detail about our GOTV program and how we're gonna run our staging locations. And we've got a couple dates that we're running this process before election day. Every time we do it, we get a little better, a little more efficient, a little bit more effective. So what do we think it's going to take us to win in November? Our focus is gonna be growing and training our volunteers and our volunteer leaders, mobilizing voters to vote for Democrats up and down the ballot, and number three here, fighting to make sure those votes are counted. So item three, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail about that today. We have a voter protection director, a voter protection team, voter protection volunteers, and they've got a robust program running in tandem to our voter contact program. So they've got that, um, running, working, they've got their processes. We're really going to be focusing on items one or two. So I want to thank you for giving up your time on a Sunday afternoon, being here with, with Sarah and me. Um, and we're so glad to have so many of our county party chairs and other volunteer leaders teaming up with us to go through this GOTB period. I wanted to outline as we get started here, some tangible, some, some details about what it means to team up with the state party during GOTV. There are a few things here that we will provide. We're gonna have updated scripts for GOTV. We will provide literature. Um, and I know that there has at times been a little bit of a backlog, especially once the top of the ticket changed, but we recently got a huge uh, shipment of lit. So it should be making its way out to the counties now. We are going to provide updated targets and we will cut turf for your canvases. And a structured GOTV program, like the one we're talking about today, what's in it for you, is that it's gonna help you recruit, train and integrate new volunteers. Uh, when we look at some of the, the other states that are kind of our role models that, that really have, um, just been killing it the past several election cycles. I think of Wisconsin. The Wisconsin Democratic Party is a really strong organization and they have a really structured GOTB program that helps them win. And that's what we are implementing this year as well. Um, you will get an influx of volunteers. Uh, I've seen it happen each of the, this might be my sixth GOTB, um, volunteers come out of the woodwork and whatever level of volunteers you are seeing now in, in your county or your organization, that last Saturday, um, November 2nd, uh, before election day, you're going to have two or three times the number of volunteers that you have now. People will continue getting involved for the first time. So with this robust program, it'll be easy for us to integrate those new volunteers in the program. 
And all of this helps improve our chances of winning. So by working together, we'll have a sense of the priority precincts that, that you are targeting, how many volunteers you have signed up, and making sure you have all of your canvases scheduled from now until the end of the election. That will give us insight into where we might need to shift some resources. Um, Sarah and I and, and the rest of the, the staffers um, at the state party, we hear from volunteers all the time who say, hey, I got 20 people here in my Democratic club in New Jersey. We want to come to North Carolina and knock doors. Where should we go? Um, so by having this robust program set up and planned out, it helps us see, hey, you know what? We could use more resources in whatever county and help um, shift around some of those resources. That was the introduction to early vote and get out the vote. I'm going to start talking about staging locations and the specific staging location leader roles next. I'm going to pause first. Uh, if you have a question, you could type in the chat, raise your Zoom hand, let us know. Oh, um, I see Jan, maybe? Can you unmute? Yes. Hey. I'm I'm not able to find the chat. I'm not able to figure out how to do this. I think I might be in the wrong place. I'm okay. a brand new volunteer. Ah, okay. So Jan, I think um, I should send you the link maybe for the Canvas training. I train new volunteers on how to no knock doors on every okay. Tuesday and Thursday. Okay. Same thing here for Cheryl, maybe. So if, you, um, if you're not a county party chair, a volunteer leader, if you haven't knocked a door yet, then nope. um, Sarah, could you drop the link in the chat for canvassing? And then Jan, um, I know you said you can't see the chat Maybe Sarah could text that link to you. Would that work? Sure. What's your phone number? 253-709-2628. Okay, hang tight. Sarah is going to text that link to you and drop it in the chat. Thank you for self-identifying here. We'll get you in the right place. Great, thank you. Yes. Okay. Okay, so Cheryl and Jan are going to get that canvassing link. Um, Cheryl, hang tight. Jan, you could probably leave the Zoom if you want. Sarah's going to text you that link. Um, I am going to put my phone number in the chat too if you want to write that down just in case you don't get what you need. I can follow up with you tomorrow. Elizabeth, you're in a good place. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's start talking about staging locations and staging location leaders. Um, one of our friends here, when I was asking about GOTV and what's different, Bob. Bob said a single location. Um, the staging location is the hub of activity for GOTV and early vote. Um, it's a physical spot and it is where we're going to have volunteers gather, where our staging location leaders will gather and it'll really be the spot where we launch all of our uh, canvases from. I also now wanna share a couple of other um, maybe new terms here that are related to the timing of when we're going to use staging locations. We talk about dry run, early vote, and GOTV. So dry run is a dress rehearsal. It's a practice. So we have a dry run scheduled for Saturday and Sunday. Um, and that's gonna be an opportunity for us to practice using our GOTV scripts and universes and the staging location processes. Um, and that helps us get ready for early vote. So come October 17th, when people can vote in person, every Saturday and Sunday, every weekend from then until the end of the election, we will run staging locations. 
And we will also use all these processes during the final four days. Here are the exact dates I'm talking about. So our dry run, the dress rehearsal, is going to be the 28th and 29th. We're going to have early vote weekends, October 19th, 20th, 26th, and 27th. And then the final four is Saturday, November 2nd, Sunday the 3rd, Monday the 4th, and Tuesday the 5th. So these are the days when we will be using our staging location program, our GOTV program, GOTV scripts, universes. If you are a county or an organization that is also knocking doors or making calls during the week, awesome, fantastic, all gravy, thank you, keep going. Um, we won't have the same reporting structure during the week, but every door we knock, every call we make during the week is also, of course, critically important and helping us. Now, I will share these slides tomorrow. So if you haven't gotten a chance to write them all down, they're coming. I have a printout of a calendar where I have these all uh, marked down. What I also want to say that's different is that we are going to have multiple shifts per day or per weekend. So, um, for example, if you're a county party chair and you have been working with Sarah and her team to have a canvas um, every Saturday, we're going to ask you to start thinking about doing that every Saturday and Sunday or every Saturday have two or three Canvas launches. Um, so we're, we will be having multiple shifts on each of these days. Uh, I see a question from Ann. Are these events coordinated with the Harris Coordinated Campaign? Yes, and so um, Sarah and her team are, are working closely with the Harris Coordinated Campaign to kind of divide and conquer. So they are focused in some areas and we are focused in geographically other areas. Yeah, um, and we're also tracking things so that what we don't want to do and what we're re working really hard to avoid is having people from different groups all knock on the same 1,000 doors in Charlotte, right? Like we're making sure that we are doing whatever we can to hit as many people as possible in every organization reaching different parts of the state. Uh, okay, multiple shifts per day, per weekend. Whatever you're currently doing, think about it being two to three X during this early vote and get out the vote season. Okay, staging location leader, that's the kind of catch-all term that I use for all of the specific roles that we have here on this screen. So the staging location director is the person who's coordinating and organizing the staging location and the captains. The Canvas captain's primary responsibility is training volunteers on canvassing and minivan. The packet captain's primary responsibility is signing out turfs and handing out lit to the volunteers. And then the confirm captain is making confirmation calls uh, to make sure our volunteers show up. I'm gonna go into more detail on those in, in a little bit. This is what that team could look like. Now, this isn't, I'm not a super hierarchical person. This isn't you know necessarily about hierarchy. But what I will say is that, you know, Sarah and her team, they're a team of six. There are 100 counties across the state. So it's really going to be very helpful for us that each staging location, each county, each organization has one point of contact, that staging location director, that is our main point of contact. Just if we had to talk to all four of these people across 100 counties, it's a lot. So we really want the staging location director to be the primary point of contact with our team. So this is kind of the baseline of how we think about stru structuring um, this team at your staging location. Now, this is one of those points where I said, we have diversity in North Carolina, we have different types of communities. So if this is the baseline, this is our, this is our optimistic 
staging location. I'm going to start with like, if you are someplace, you are already cranking, you've got canvases you're doing every single weekend. You think when you think like, okay, if my, if my canvases were two to three times as big, I'm going to have a big staging location. In that case, I've got some optional roles that you might consider also recruiting leaders for because you're going to have a big staging location. So optional roles here, maybe you have on-site phone banking or you have a county specific or st statewide phone bank and you've got volunteers doing that on Zoom. Uh, you might want to have a phone bank captain to be the person who's coordinating that for you through the final stretch. On-site at your staging location, maybe you have a comfort captain. Um, this is somebody who's making sure uh, we're eating more than candy bars and pizza. I don't know, keeping the, the coffee pot filled, uh, water bottles, bringing in some fruit, making sure the physical environment doesn't get too chaotic. That might be someone we would call a comfort captain. Maybe you have someone specifically who is calling people who haven't uh, shown up for their shift. We would call that a, a no-show chase captain. Maybe you have a big enough staging location. You want to dedicate someone to be your sign-in captain to greet people when they show up, mark them as attended, and, and help them um, navigate through the staging location. On the other side, I know we have some some counties or organizations that have modest size um, canvas crews. So if you are going to have a modest staging location, maybe currently you can round up enough volunteers to canvas every other week. So maybe for you having that go two every week and one Saturday and one set Sunday, maybe that's what two to three times the volume looks like for you. In that case, you might have fewer people who you want to serve as your staging location leadership team. For example, maybe the staging location director is also the person making your confirmation calls and your canvas captain is also handing out packets. Um, Sarah and I had some, some conversation about this. It could look like maybe your staging location director is also handing out packets and your Canvas captain is doing the training and also making the confirmation calls. Um, the, the titles and the hierarchy is not nearly as important as making sure the responsibilities and the tasks are being completed. Um, so these were a couple examples of what, you know, this is kind of our baseline. This is our starting point as we're thinking about it. If you got a big crew, you might have some optional roles. And if uh, you have a smaller crew, maybe it looks something like this. Next, I'm going to go deeper into the physical staging location and what that could be, how you might set it up. I'm gonna pause here to see what questions you have um, uh, on the uh, staging location and the leader roles. I'll go into more details later, but um, that was a, a sneak peek of what those roles look like. All right, I'll keep trucking along. Let's look at the staging locations a little deeper. So uh, this is a repeat slide. The staging location is the hub of uh, activity during GOTV. Give me one moment. I'm placing an order with my husband to bring me some, some warm tea. I'm going to lose my voice today. Um, okay, so this is the staging location. Ideally, this location will be the same place on each of these days. The dry run, the GOT early vote weekends, and the final four, ideally. This is another case where based on your community, maybe every, the same place every one of these days doesn't make sense. For example, if you've got a county that is physically really spread out, maybe you've got a population hub on the this is the west side, you got a population hub on the east side. 
maybe you have one place on the west side on Saturdays and a different place as your staging location uh, on the east side. I'm losing track of which one's east and west. On the other side of the county, maybe on Sundays, you have a staging location there. Um, what I would say is just be thoughtful about how you're thinking about where to have these staging locations. Here are some examples of places that make a good staging location. If you're here because you're, you know, county party chair, use that office. Ideal, if you have an office, use that. It's a great spot. If you don't have a county party office, think about a volunteer's home or garage. That can make a really good staging location. Um, maybe a community center. So I know um, some counties launch their canvases from libraries. Uh, the only caution there is, is um, you know, every time you use it, you would probably have to reset up. Whereas if it's somebody's home or your county party office, you can kind of set it up physically once and use it. Um, also a storefront. So if, if there's a strong Democrat in your area who has a small business, maybe they're an accountant or a lawyer, and so they have an office and they're willing to let you use that, that can also be um, a really good spot for a staging location. Some of the things that you want to have in your staging location, access to restrooms, electricity, Wi-Fi, uh, cell phone service, someplace that's a comfortable temperature. I said earlier, I'm from Ohio, like I'm not doing a staging location in November in Ohio in somebody's garage, right? Like that would be too cold. Here, we've got a milder climate, so that probably works. Um, you need to have uh, some access to parking. Hopefully it's available for all of those dry runs, early vote and the final four days of GOTV. I also encourage you to think about accessibility of uh, the location, really for any event you're doing in person. Also for this, uh, when I'm doing an in-person event, I like to add notes to mobilize about how many handicapped parking spots are there? Is there a ramp from um, the parking lot into the facility? Um, is the door wide enough for a wheelchair to fit through? Um, some of those details are really good to include in general um, and especially now for your in-person event. Also a note here on the slide, if you are a staging location leader, bring your laptop. Bring your laptop, your power cord, your cell phone, be fully charged up. Um, I like to have um, headset AirPods because clearly I need to <laughs> gesticulate. I'm always talking with my hands. Uh, so I need to have headphones so I can move my hands. Otherwise my mouth doesn't work. So let's talk about how to set up that physical staging location. I've got an example on the screen and a spoiler alert, I don't like this example. What do you notice about this staging location and um, things that need improved? Or if there's some things here you like. You wanna type in the chat or come off mute? It's not very clear like where to go at the first, like either if you're walking in the door or from the perspective of the where do I go character, like no. I feel like in the staging locations, we want we want somebody at the front desk, so to speak. Yeah, um, exactly. Bob's pointing the same thing out in the, ch the chat. The traffic flow isn't great. Um, people not working. This lady on the couch, you know, she's lounging. Um, I'm pretty sure she's in high heels, which uh, I don't recommend for canvassing. Yeah, it's really not clear. So I'm gonna share some specific tips for effective staging locations. First is, um, yeah, Andrew. Yes, that's exactly it. Um, staging location should kind of be like an assembly line. This is a better example of a staging location. Uh, what do you notice about this staging location that's an improvement. What do you like about it? And is there anything 
missing. Not enough canvassers. Well, yeah, there aren't actually any canvassers in this photo. So yeah, good call. More workspace. It's a bit, it's more spread out, right? And we've got these green area arrows. I have seen people literally use duct tape to tape arrows to show people like, like if you've ever shopped at an Ikea and like you follow a path to get from department to department. Um, yeah, so we've got we've got a good flow here. We've got some signage on the walls, sign in. Here's the canvas training. We've got the captains by their spots. You can see the flow is kind of a loop. We've got the returning canvassers coming in from another direction. We even have bunting on the walls, which just makes it, you know, a bit more fun. So one of the tips is to have the outgoing and incoming canvassers have a separate path to follow so it's not um, too crowded. I'll talk a little bit later about the, the schedule that we're following um, because we're gonna have set canvas times. And what we're planning is three hour canvas shifts starting every two hours, which is one way that we think we can keep the incoming and outgoing uh, canvassers organized. So I usually say no couches or chairs in the assembly line. Um, of course, there is an accessibility exception if people, you know, need to be sitting to do their work. Cool. Um, what I really mean is like, let's not make it too comfortable. We don't want it to be a hangout zone like that lady was lounging on the couch. Because um, if people are hanging out, they're not working. Got a lot of uh, voters to talk to. Sorry, I just got my tea delivery. Thank you. Okay. Um, another recommendation is to label everything. So label the entrance, label the exit, the table to sign in, where do canvassers go, um, snack table, restrooms. I also love having these large post-it notes up around the staging location. Uh, I'm gonna put one with like, here's the, the Wi-Fi, so you can connect to the network to download your list. Um, probably have instructions by the Canvas training location to tell people how to download minivan if they've never used minivan before. Um, I am going to provide um, signage for you that you can print out. Um, so you don't need to, to create this. I will, uh, I will be sharing that. Finally here, practice is really important. And that's why our dry run next weekend, we're gonna try to have it be as realistic as possible. Voters aren't actually voting, but we're gonna use our GOTB script and universe. Um, we're gonna use these staging location processes. And it's an opportunity for us to work out the kinks. Every time we do this, we're going to get better. This weekend will be our first opportunity to try these techniques and, you know, give us feedback on what's working for you. What isn't? Are there more training opportunities? Do you need more templates? Um, how did it go so that we can get better every weekend? Finally, here for your staging location, have fun. Um, I've seen some really creative activities at staging locations, themes. Uh, of course, people love to do Halloween themed uh, foam banks and canvases, um, but have a good time. Um, being at a staging location can be a really incredible bonding opportunity. Um, it can be, it's just a lot of fun to kind of be in the trenches with your volunteers and everybody moving towards the same goal. So have fun at your staging location. I'm gonna talk next about volunteer recruitment, but before I do that, what questions do you have about staging locations? Yeah. 
Hey, um, Kathy, Christy, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so our staging location, we think, is going to be outside a grocery store. Mm. And we did kind of a dry run on our own last week. Just any tips? Um, we tried to, we're kind of squatting. <laughs> um, um, and we're in front of an empty storefront. So any tips on, you know, staying out of trouble? <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me a little bit more about the context and why you're using that location. I'm assuming you don't have um, an existing office. Was that? Yeah. And the part of the county that we want to, that we're canvassing, we don't have um, an office. Um, so is there any volunteers home or garage you could use? Possibly. I guess we didn't. Um, we thought a public location might be better actually than a home, but you've done houses yeah yeah um i think i would i would see if there's somebody who would let you do it at their house right. um like you said so that you don't get run off um now if if that just won't work you know it right. won't work um and then maybe you've got like um i've got a crv so i've got a good backspace that I sometimes have set up as like my right. office, you know, right. and I've got my lit and I've got my, it'll just be, um, it will be a little more challenging than if you can find a carport garage, someone's house to use, um, you know, be off in a small corner, mm -hmm. um, stay out of the way of cars. Makes right. Me um, right. Yeah. How did it go in your dry run? Actually, it went really well, and you know, it went well. I mean, there was a restroom at the, there, we were far enough away from the grocery store, so we weren't interfering, and we're in front of a vacant storefront, so the grocery store had restrooms, and people could go in and buy a snack, so, and it, it was on a Sunday, so there wasn't a lot of car traffic. It actually went pretty well, but I don't know in the long you, run. How, how about go. training, training canvassers? Did that work okay? Yeah, we were under a there was an overhead overhang. Okay. And, yeah. But, um, you know, when we need to be scrappy, we're scrappy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about volunteer recruitment. And this is training that, um, this part in particular, I normally give to staff, uh, and, so you might you might have been on the re receiving end of some of these tips in years past, but uh, I want to make sure all of us uh, staging location leaders know uh, some of this information. So GOTV volunteer recruitment, there are some ways that it's different than the recruitment the rest of the time. One, the sense of urgency is different. There's no maybe I'll volunteer or I'll volunteer later. I'll volunteer when we get closer to the election. It's like it's now. It's now or never. Uh, you're in this fight with us or you're on the sidelines. So um, everybody who has previously said maybe or later, now is the time to get them signed up. Uh, we will be persistent. So part of this and, you know, you've probably heard from our team that we're trying to get all of the canvases scheduled from now until November 5th. One of the benefits of that is that we can get people scheduled for as many of those dates as possible, and it helps us have insight to where we have enough volunteer capacity and where we might need to shift resources. Also, I'm going to talk later about um, and share a little bit of a script for making confirmation and recruitment calls, but um, I like to have options for people so that instead of saying we're canvassing Saturday, can you join us? And they say, no, I want to say we're canvassing every Saturday from now until election day, which Saturdays can you join us? Oh, you can't do Saturdays. Well, good news. We're doing Sundays too. Which Sundays can you join us? So having all of these shifts, all of these mobilized events posted gives you the opportunity to sign people up, um, for as many shifts as possible all through November 5th. GOTV recruitment is also expansive. So you might have a core group of people who have been volunteering with you a lot. I've been telling you that um, volunteers are going to come out of the woodwork. Some of those will be people who just find us. And some of those will be people that you proactively reach out to 
um, and are able to recruit. So reaching beyond the people that we currently know, uh, and a couple slides for my vote builder friends in particular, I have a couple of tips, and then layered. So not only do we need more volunteers, but we need more shifts from each volunteer. So you might see us start talking more about shifts and talking less about people or volunteers. So we've got two days on a dry run, we've got four days during early vote and the final four days. So that's nine days. You might have a volunteer who signs up for one shift on each of those days, or maybe they sign up for two shifts every Saturday. So that's not one volunteer, that's potentially nine shifts or however many shifts that they sign up for. So that language uh, change is a little bit subtle, but um, we'll start talking about shifts and I encourage you to also think about shifts, not people. So some tips for recruiting is know in advance when people show up for a shift during early vote in GOTV, know if they are scheduled for other dates. When they come to check in, I want to reshift them for future dates. Uh, in Vote Builder, you can search a couple of different ways in Vote Builder. Um, happy to, to walk through this in more detail if you ever want to come to my office hours or reach out. But on the My Campaign side of Vote Builder, I'm going to be pulling really expansive lists. Who do I have in Vote Builder in my county who is not yet signed up for a GOTV shift? Maybe they volunteered in 2022 or 2020 and they haven't had a chance to volunteer yet this year. I want to call those people now and say, we're, we're scheduled for GOTV, come join us. You could also look on the My Voter side of GOTV and see who has been tagged as a volunteer prospect and call through those people as well to get them signed up. Of course, we're always gonna be making an ask now. Every event, every social media post, if you have a newsletter, end everything with an ask to get people to sign up. And then with your current volunteers, have them brainstorm as well. Who do they know who might be interested in volunteering? Even if it's somebody who, for example, might not be comfortable knocking doors and talking to voters, if they're willing to be someone who drives people door to door, if they're willing to walk with someone who's knocking doors, they're willing to drive people to the polls, um, even those people who, who aren't as comfortable talking to strangers, talking to voters, there's a role for them. So if you've ever um, had a political training, uh, you might have heard about hard ask. Hard ask is this concept of, of making a really compelling ask of someone to, to join us. So a hard ask uses strong language, it's specific, unapologetic, and it's urgent and gives context. So let me give an example of this. Uh, here's kind of a, you know, a weak recruitment ask. Hey, do you think you'd like to volunteer? It's better than not asking anybody, but it's not that strong. Gets a little bit better if we say, hey, we're knocking doors this weekend. Can you join us? But then I've got this third example here on the screen that I think is much stronger. Do we have anybody here who wants to volunteer to read the GOTV hard ask on screen? This election is extremely important. Every single vote matters and we have no time to lose. Hey, we're gonna be talking to voters all over the county this Saturday at 9 a.m., at 12 noon, at 3 p.m., and at 5 p.m., 6 p.m. Most people are signed up for two shifts. What time works best for you, Sally? Thank you, Bob. So you can see that this ask, we've got urgency in here, right? It's important, we've got no time to lose. It's specific, Saturday, 9, 12, 3, 6. Unapologetic, I'm not, you know, softening this ask. I am asking which time works best for you. We've given context, we've expressed urgency, it's strong, specific language. Thank you, Bob. 
Now, I, I will say um, hard ask is one of those skills that uh, for me, at least, if I'm not reminding myself of it regularly, uh, sometimes I slack off and I make an ask and I'm like, oh, that wasn't hard enough. I could have been more specific. So this is definitely the kind of thing that with practice, you'll get more comfortable. Uh, you will be surprised by some people and what they say yes to. So that's why we're going to be unapologetic um, and jump right in to making that ask. This period, I'm going to start like every conversation I have with a countdown. I started this training with the countdown. How many days are left? Um, we want every volunteer to feel like we're relying on them because we are. We know we can't do this work by ourselves. And the more volunteers we have, the more of the millions of voters in North Carolina we can talk to. We've also expressed urgency here. You know, um, I can't commit right now or I can help later. Like there's no later. This is, it's now or never. Um, so I'm gonna keep asking until um, I get somebody signed up or until, you know, they really give me a hard no. Um, and this is how I'm going to do that. So when you're asking someone to volunteer and there's resistance, I'm going to dig a little deeper because people might be saying, no, not that. So uh, we're canvassing every Saturday, 9, 12, 3, and 6. How many of those days can I sign you up for? They're like, well, uh, no, no, I can't do that. Is it because they're not comfortable canvassing? Maybe I can sign them up for a phone bank. Is it because, um, no, not then, right? Like we're, we're canvassing this Saturday, 9, 12, and 3. Which shifts can you take? No, I can't do that. We've got Sunday as well. This is one of the reasons we really encourage people to have your mobilize links up with all of your dates scheduled out so you have a lot of options to offer up to somebody. Somebody might be saying, no, not ever. But I'm going to ask some follow-up questions. I'm going to give people choices to try to find what works for them. Um, one of the tips in this hard ask is, is to think of it a little bit about um, how maybe you give your kids or your grandkids or your nieces and nephews options. You're not going to ask a three-year-old, what do you want for dinner? You're going to say, do you want spaghetti or do you want a peanut butter and jelly? A little bit of um, that is what we're going to apply to this. Do you want to canvas on Saturdays or Sundays? Which works better for you, noon or three? Three o'clock works? Great. Can I put you down for three o'clock every day? Think about those options. Also, what I've got here is start with your biggest ask and then negotiate down. Um, and what I mean by this, your big asks are probably going to be like for your best volunteers, if they're still working, can you take off work Monday and Tuesday to canvas all day? Last two days of the election. Um, can you can you join us for each of our canvas shifts? And then work your way down. Um, but start with that really big ask. And people, there will be people who say yes to you to really huge asks. Uh, there's also a concept about asking through the yes. So if somebody says, yes, I can come Saturday at three, great. Sounds like three o'clock's good for you. I'll put you down for three o'clock on Sunday too. Sounds like Saturday's good for you. We've got we've got three Saturdays before the election. I'll sign you up at three o'clock for each of those. So if somebody's saying yes, I want to assume that there are a lot of yeses there. Can you bring a friend with you to Canvas? Even if they don't want to knock the doors, just having somebody with you can make the time go by a little easier. We need people, uh, maybe you're in a more rural part of the state. Um, it's it's less dense. We need people to drive canvassers. Um, can you get your own ride? Do you know someone who who can make uh, who can drive other volunteers around? So I'm going to keep asking um, and try to identify all the ways somebody can help us out. Help themselves. <laughs> 